In this lecture, we are going to talk about the large intestine. We're at literally the end of our GI tract. Here, we will talk about the structure and function of the large intestine and right nearby, attached to the large intestine, the appendix. The major functions of the large intestine. The large intestine has peristalsis and a specialized movement called mass movement. The mass movement are these large movements that are going to move the undigested food waste through the large intestine. The large intestine secretes a lot of mucus to help to move that waste through. By this time, all of the important digestion and absorption has occurred. We have finished the processes in the small intestine, so there's no digestion in the large intestine. There is a little bit of absorption, and that is pretty much just water and salt. That helps to concentrate the feces, or the undigested waste, into a more solid mass for elimination. Of course, spending too long in the digestive tract, especially too long in the colon, can lead to an excess of water and salt absorption and can make it difficult to move that fecal matter through. Let's look at the regions of the large intestine. So starting here, we're at the very end of the small intestine. That's the ileum. The ileum joins the first part of the large intestine, which is the cecum. The cecum is the pouch just at the bottom of the large intestine. Attached to the cecum is the appendix, although the specific location of the appendix varies across individuals. From there, then, the digestive contents move up through the ascending colon. This is moving up the right side of the abdominal cavity, up the ascending colon. And then they cross over the abdominal cavity through the transverse colon. And then down the left portion of the abdominal cavity through the descending colon. Then the colon or the large intestine makes an S shape or a sigmoid shape. That's the sigmoid colon. The sigmoid colon is the last curve of the colon before we get to the straight portion leading to the anal canal. The term for straight is rectus. So the straight portion of the colon is the rectum. From the rectum to the anal canal, we have sphincters. The rectosigmoid sphincter can help to control the contents from the rectum to the anal canal. And then the anal canal is that last portion where the fecal matter will be released out and excreted. The anal canal has internal and external anal sphincters, internal smooth muscle, and external skeletal muscle to control the defecation reflex or the release of that fecal matter. Before we get too far, I don't want to forget to tell you about the appendix. The appendix is not vestigial meaning that sometimes you hear these reports that the appendix is just left over from evolutionary biology. That's not true. Actually, our current research shows that it has re-evolved multiple times in our evolutionary history. So evolutionary biology, comparative anatomy, microbiology, and immunology all tell us that the appendix is there for a reason. The issue is, we're still trying to figure out what that region reason is. What we see now from the current research is that the appendix has a high concentration of beneficial bacteria. So we think of it as a, as a safe house for bacteria. 
It also has a high concentration of immune cells and lymphoid tissue, suggesting that it has a role in immunity. It's a narrow tube-like shape and its position helps to avoid the passive flow of fecal material into the appendix. Of course, we know that the appendix can be really pesky. It's subject to inflammation. In some cases, it can get filled with fecal matter, and that can lead to inflammation of the appendix, and that's appendicitis. That's one of the most common medical emergencies is inflammation of the appendix because if the appendix were to burst, it can be very dangerous releasing bacteria and even fecal matter into the abdominal cavity. So the appendix is often removed for patients who have had appendicitis. But what we know from studies in patients where the appendix was removed is that some of those patients are higher risk for getting bacterial infections of the colon, especially multi-resistant bacterial infections. So for this reason, we think that the appendix actually serves a function of helping to replenish good bacteria following infection of the colon. The microbiome within the gut or within the colon and intestines is also very important. And this is also an area of new research. Bacteria accumulate in the large intestine because the motility is fairly slow. The estimates are anywhere from 500 to 1,000 different species of bacteria, mostly anaerobic bacteria, including Clostridia, Lactobacillus, and E. coli within our gut microbiome. This research is so fascinating. I'm linking you here to the Human Microbiome Project, so you can keep track of this research if you're curious. The gut microbiome is variable across individuals, almost variable enough to provide a fingerprint-like identification of individuals based on their microbiome. What do we know about the microbiome? It helps to prevent pathogenic bacterial growth, so the presence of good bacteria prevents the presence of bad bacteria. It helps to break down dietary fibers, which also produces gas and it helps to promote motility because of that gas production. It maintains the mucosa layer within the large intestine. They synthesize vitamin K, metabolize bile, androgens, estrogens, and lipids, and they can convert unabsorbed carbohydrates into organic acids. Finally, they can also help to metabolize nitrogenous waste. So many things we're finding out about the good bacteria within our gut. And I think in the next several years, you all will hear a lot more about this research as it's starting to really take hold. Okay, now to more specifics on the structure and function of the large intestine. First, the mucosa. The mucosal lining of the large intestine is a columnar epithelium with a ton of goblet cells. Remember that goblet cells produce mucus. That can neutralize the acid from the local bacteria and can provide lubrication for the passage of materials through the colon. The large intestine has crypts, which are folds for increased surface area, helping for the active absorption of water and electrolytes. The motility of the large intestine includes the mass movements and haustral contractions. Haustra are the little pouches that you see of the large intestine. Notice these curving regions separating portions of the large intestine. Those are the haustra or little pouches. Haustra can contract. They have these ring-like contractions at a rate of about one every 30 minutes. That can help to mix and knead the contents of the large intestine. They are triggered by parasympathetic input 
and help to increase the contents of the colon with the mucosal surface for the absorption of the water and electrolytes. Finally then, mass movements. Mass movements are the slowest and largest of all the movements in the GI tract. These are contractions of large segments of the colon at a rate of about three to four contractions per day. Big mass movements, very slow. They help to drive defecation and they're triggered by hormones and a particular reflex called the gastro colic reflex. So they're triggered by the enterogastrones, cholecystokinin and secretin. They're also triggered by gastrin release. Gastrin release occurs when food enters the stomach. That is the gastrocolic reflex. So food enters the stomach and that sends a hormonal signal down to the colon to say, hey, we got new food coming in. Get rid of that old stuff to make room for the new incoming food. That's the gastro colic reflex. The joke in my household is always with the kids, right? How hard is it to get your kids to sit down at the table to eat? Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, eat, 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 right? I have little kids. Finally, as soon as they sit down, you finally get them to start eating. They take a couple of bites and then they look up at you and they say, mommy, I have to poop. And it's like, oh, okay. They're not trying to trick you. That's the gastrocolic reflex. So when food enters the stomach, you have that reflex to get rid of the undigested food later on down in the colon. Then you gotta wait, they go to the bathroom, they come back, okay, then you can sit and finish your meal. The gastrocolic reflex and the mass movements of the large intestine are inhibited by sympathetic nervous system activity just as other motility and secretions are inhibited by the sympathetic nervous system in the GI tract. Finally, the anal canal. The anal canal are the last three centimeters of the rectum open to the external environment. There's an internal involuntary anal sphincter and an external voluntary anal sphincter. These will be activated during the process of defecation. So the defecation reflex controls the elimination of stool or feces from the large intestine. It starts when fecal matter enters the sigmoid colon and the rectum wall. That stretch will be detected and will lead to the urge to defecate. This will lead to involuntary contraction of the rectum and relaxation of the involuntary internal anal sphincter smooth muscle. And then, of course, that voluntary control can contract the external anal sphincter and override the release of contents if the time is not right for elimination. It's very important that you understand that the defecation reflex is controlled by the sacral spinal cord. It's promoted by parasympathetic input from the pelvic splanchnic nerves, and it's inhibited by sympathetic input from the sacral splanchnic nerves. That's because damage to the sacral spinal cord can lead to incontinence. Incontinence or lack of the ability to control the defecation reflex is a red flag for spinal cord damage. So remember that the sacral spinal cord is responsible for control of the defecation reflex. Okay, let's see how you're doing with the GI tract overall. Here's a quick activity you can do to check your knowledge. The most common form of lactose intolerance is lactase non-persistence. This is where the small intestine makes less of the enzyme lactase after infancy. It's not a milk allergy, but rather an enzyme deficiency. So as lactase levels decline, and when products containing lactose are ingested, milk products, then that lactose sugar is not broken down, and it passes into the large intestine undigested. 
So here's our case. Audrey, she's a 13-year-old female and she's lactose intolerant. She ingests two big bowls of ice cream at her friend's house during a birthday party. Begin at the oral cavity and follow the digestion of ice cream for Audrey. Explain why she will have diarrhea, gas, bloating, nausea, and stomach pain. If you understand this, then you've got a good full view of what's happening through the digestive tract. All right, give it a try and let me know if you have any questions.